Thank you for joining us for this panel session, 99 Problems, but Adoption 8-1. I'm Maria Strukoff, Senior Manager of Customer Engagement here at ThoughtSpot. And our panelists today are Michael Rando, Director of Business Intelligence and Analytics at Albertsons, Katie Kirk, Analytics Insight Manager, Truist, and Yoss Stoke, Analytics Director, Wells Fargo Bank. Our panelists have extensive experience and a proven track record in driving self-service analytics adoption. During this session, they will share practical strategies aimed at equipping and empowering all levels of your organization to make better decisions using data. Let's get started. So I'd like to kick us off with a quick introduction um, around the group. Um, it'd be great if everyone can share your name, your role, um, and one thing that you like to do on weekends. So I've, I'll kick us off again. My name is Maria. I'm customer success here at ThoughtSpot. And um, now that the weather is getting warmer, um, you'll find me outside working on my urban garden in the weekends. Yes, over to you. Uh, my name is Jos Stoke. I'm an analytic director for Wells Fargo Bank, and I'm responsible for the B Business Intelligence Competency Center, which is the area of Wells Fargo that manages all enterprise tools um, and the B BI tool strategy. Oh, and now that the weather is warmer, like he said, um, I like to take my classic cars out of the window storage or driving them. Very cool. Michael? Yeah, I'm Michael Rando. I'm the Director of Merchandising Business Intelligence and Analytics for Albertson Safeway. Um, my role predominantly is around the uh, aiding and democratization of data, empowering our teams across the organization with the development of BI tools. Been with the company for 17 years, so just a little while. Um, on the weekends, I like to play video games. Oh, man. Very cool. Thank you, Michael. Katie? Katie Kirk. I'm the Analytic Insights Manager within our Insights and Decision Sciences team at Truist. My particular team aims to deliver self-service solutions to our retail and small business banking partners, and we aim to capture insights more quickly, share them more broadly, and scale the work of our Decision Sciences team to enable faster data-driven decision-making. Uh, on the weekends, I am an avid golfer, no matter what the weather is. Uh, I played in, in college, so you will often find me on the golf course. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So to get things started um, around adoption, again, let's go down the line. I'd like to hear from everyone, um, starting with you, Michael. What use cases are you primi primarily focusing on with ThoughtSpot? Our current use case focuses on empowering our 3,500 internal users with easy access to really granular information down to the day, actual UPC on the can, and store level data. Um, this is a data set with over 45 billion rows of data. And as many of you know, um, Power BI, our, our other visualization tool, is just not equipped to handle that um, depth and breadth of data. And so this mainly allows our analysts across the organization to dig down to the level of data that they need without the need to understand SQL. Very cool. Thank you. Yes. Um, so for Wells Fargo, we have pretty much any BI tool under the sun. Um, but our focus for ThoughtSpot is specifically to enable self-service for end users. So those people that are not analysts or the, uh, web tool, web uh, report developers, uh, but they do, they do know their domain data well, and they can therefore discover their own data and, and um, uh, you know, find insights and do their, what I call everyday BI type of uh, analysis uh, without max, you know, without much training, you know, they have a real job. So I'm talking about somebody who's like a bank branch manager and needs to find out which ATMs will well, typically run out of money during the weekends, things like that. Absolutely makes sense. Katie? Our main use cases connect client data with uh, their transactions. So similar to Michael, we're talking millions and millions of records, millions of clients, millions of transactions. And when we first piloted this use case, it was immediate, the speed and the value that we were able to recognize with ThoughtSpot. Um, and it tackled numerous different business questions that we had related to our client base, understanding the opportunity and the sizing of certain uh, populations within our client base. 
Uh, but the transaction data piece was where we saw the most power and we were able to explore a use case looking at existing clients who may have loan payments at other financial institutions. And that was an insight we were able to uncover in minutes with ThoughtSpot. Whereas if we were to take that same use case back to our existing toolkit, it would have taken days to even weeks. Wow, that all sounds super powerful. Um, which kind of leads me to my next question. And yes, um, you were just talking about self-service. I think all of you have just mentioned um, data democratization and some shape or form, but um, yes, you were specifically talking about self-service, this everyday BI. Um, so I'd love to hear from you on this one. Um, just walk me through your goals around promoting data democratization and self-service analytics adoption. Yeah, so, you know, empowering the end users is great for the end users. So that's a great goal, but also we have a selfish goal, which is to reduce the back and forth of the cycle of developing reports. You know, a lot of, we develop a ton of static reports, a user requests something, some sort of insight, they get a static reports, it goes back and go, can you add this column? Can you put this timestamp into the filter? You know, all these kinds of things. And by the time they get their answer back, it may no longer be relevant, right? We're talking weeks that these, this kind of cycle happens. So the users are ecstatic with the fact that they can find the answers right away um, and do it themselves. You know, they know their data and they, they're they empowered to do it. I am. Um, that I bet I see, I'm looking at you, Katie, because that's sort of what you had just mentioned. I bet that resonates with you um, around. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes more broadly, we just, we use the phrase transform thinking from reporting to insight. And if you could sum that up in a goal of ours, that absolutely relates. I love that tagline of transforming from reporting to insights because um, that's really where, why we, that's why we want to drive adoption to move more towards the insight, um, actually getting insights instead of just consuming. Yeah. And if I can add, you know, we, we have a strategy of reducing the number of BI tools we have. We have way too many. And, you know, many users are reluctant to get off of their existing tools because they're comfortable with that. Um, so ThoughtSpot is sort of a carrot, right? We introduce them to ThoughtSpot, they get all excited. And even the analysts and, and developers get excited because they, they recognize right away that they're offering their end users a much nicer and much more modern type of interface than they used to have before. That's an awesome point, Yas, um, around the benefits and the, the sort of the what's in it for me for an analyst versus um, a business end user, specifically when we're talking about driving adoption. And um, I've got, I think we'll we'll probably be looping back to that one um, later on today, I'm sure. Um, and actually, you know, th this sort of gets me thinking, like I know there's no one single silver bullet to driving adoption, um, but, um, you know, Katie, again, it, I'd love to hear from you on this one because it, you know, are, are, have there been any specific strategies that you've used to drive um, product adoption among your internal teams? Sure. Uh, to your point, I think we're still figuring it out, of course, but we have seen a few things that have worked. Um, and to me, I see two unique populations that we need to consider when driving adoption, which we've mentioned. You've got, you have the practitioner base, the ones who are actually able to develop within the tools. And then you have the business end users who are primarily just seeking to use data and tools to support their decision making. Uh, with practitioners, I think they're a little bit easier to win over because they already understand the value of analytics. They're already comfortable with tools and they just want to use anything that will help them uncover insights faster and prove that value faster. Um, so in my experience with the practitioner base, simple awareness and availability go a long way. Uh, and we've used forum-like sessions simply to bring awareness to our practitioner base, showcase what their peers are doing. Um, and and then at that point, it's just important to promote the tool and make sure it's available to anybody who wants to try it. For the business users, uh, I've seen three things that have worked well for my team. Recorded demos, live demos, and a newsletter. Um, for recorded demos, we'll take maybe a five-minute video clip where we will give a general overview as to how to use a tool, maybe a use case, um, who to reach out to for assistance, something like that. And that's off-the-shelf available at any time. Um, similar to recorded, live demos would cover the same types of topics, but longer sessions, maybe 30 minutes or an hour, 
with a specific business unit team where we actually dive into best applications for that team. Um, and then my favorite, the newsletter we've developed and started to deliver, um, we use that to showcase broadly analytics work coming out of our team. And I think that not only has driven adoption of the tool, but it's driven data, you know, centered thinking in general. Um, and when we see internal teams understand how their peers are making better data-driven decisions, we see more people want to participate and realize the same, which is really fun to see. Well, Mo is definitely a real tactic um, in adoption. And um, so I, I love that. Um, that, uh, yeah, I love, I love leveraging FOMO as well. I, Michael, I'm interested to hear from your perspective. You guys have 3,500 users. That's um, not a small amount of, of people that you're needing to constantly um, enable. How, how have you guys gone about that? Yeah, so the number one thing for driving adoption, in my opinion, is the users having faith in the data that they're seeing. So we have extremely rigorous checks to ensure that our data is as accurate as humanly possible. And then right after that has to come with training, right? And uh, similar to what Kitty was saying before, having um, you know self-service demo videos is very powerful. Um, we have found that by doing small group trainings with actual live demos, no PowerPoints, none of that, we actually go through the tool and we answer questions live with these different groups within the organization. Uh, that's been really powerful because then we can tailor it based on their needs. Let's say they're from the bakery department. So everything can be focused about bakery so they can actually like align how they would actually use it, right? Because they can see something all they want, but until they know, until they can see how it could relate to them, uh, that's where it gets the real power. We've also committed, and my team is not a training team, but we've committed to doing one-on-one -on -one trainings. Uh, and we've done over 300 of them uh, just over the past two months just to get people as comfortable as possible. And they're not long trainings. They're like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, just saying, hey, guys, we've got your back. We'll make the time to meet with you guys. Make sure you're as comfortable as possible. Um, another really important thing about this is um, for driving adoption is SQL can be difficult for folks to learn, and we certainly wouldn't expect um, business decision makers to learn SQL. And while a Power BI report, for example, can give them lots of great information, sometimes it's just not enough. So by empowering them to see truly detailed information down to that day level, down to that store level, even down to the transaction level, which is something that we're working on right now, uh, it just gives them a whole new level of uh, confidence in our data and really confidence in themselves and pulling that information. That, yeah, that's awesome. Go ahead, Jess. Yeah, you know, so I want to just add that, you know, we, we do demos and, and uh, testimonials and so on as well, but and we always make sure that it's the business users, you know, the end recipients of the, the tool that are the ones giving the demos. And the fact that they're so willing to do so over and over again is infectious for people that are learning about the tool. They can, they can tell their enthusiasm, and that I think is, is a very major power in, in getting people to look at it. Absolutely. Uh, that makes total sense. It's a little bit of the FOMO again. If my colleagues are doing this and they're excited about it, maybe I can be as well. I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I love what you said, um, Michael, around not using PowerPoint, um, getting in it and getting your hands dirty and rolling up your sleeves. I um, I, I see both Katie and Yoss nodding. Um, demos are... Good luck killing PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just nod. It's so powerful in proving to them that it works putting your time and your name on the line saying, I trust this so much that a live demo, I have no problem with doing it. Our goal is to get the executives to use uh, thoughts about it instead of PowerPoints. Oh, wow. I, uh, yeah. You as well, Katie? Absolutely. And, you know, it's apart from the demo perspective too, you're in a meeting with a PowerPoint. We want to go from looking at a slide on a PowerPoint to pulling up ThoughtSpot, pulling up a tool and digging into the problem live. Because then you have fewer takeaways, you know, you could answer the question right then and there. Exactly. Wow, I bet that, I see, we're, I mean, we're all nodding here. I, I bet that's going to resonate with a lot of people um, as well to hear that that is a goal. So I know that, um, especially around adoption, and especially when we're talking about P5 
people change management and asking people to change their behaviors, um, there can be challenges. Uh, and so I'd love to hear, um, and, and yes, maybe we can start with you on this one. If there are any challenges that you and your team have faced around trying to increase analytics adoption and what you've done to overcome those challenges. Yeah, without a doubt, the biggest challenge is the data, right? Because if people start playing with the data and that the answers are wrong, you know, you've, they've lost confidence and you quickly go down the drain with it, with these plans. So, and we, and the reverse is true too. I mean, people get very enthusiastic and go, oh, you know, we want to use this. And then we ask them, well, do you have a solid trusted data set? And they go, what? You know, so then we need to point them to data engineers and, you know, and that causes delays. So, um, eventually we all get there, but it sort of puts a damper on the uh, enthusiasm, unless you have these trusted data sets ready to go already. Yeah, that that um, ties back a little bit to the point, Michael, that you were just talking about around how data quality um, and sort of empowering them and starting small and giving them that confidence has been really important for boosting adoption. Yeah, you might get away with that data once for that user, but second time, they're not going to come back, right? Um, we think about it just like our, our shelves in our stores, right? A customer comes for a product and it's out of stock, they're going to lose faith in us that we're able to provide it. Um, it should be a no-brainer for them on where they can get safe, reliable information. I mean, I do have some notes on this, though, for uh, common challenges. So we're a traditional grocer. Um, so I have 17 years with the company, which may sound like a long time, um, but I'm really only halfway through. We have lots of people with over 30, 40 years, like my boss, for example, has about 40 years with the company. Um, there's a lot of people who have seen many tools come and go. And so change management is, is difficult. And I totally understand that, but it's showing the virtue of the new product, how it can do what the previous product did, but more. And I think with ThoughtSpot, something that's been really powerful for us is showing the Google semantic search, which is why it's so important that you set up your semantic search and your synonyms correctly when you're going through that. Uh, because just showing that alone is an instant buy-in from users. Absolutely. I am um, the people change management pieces. Again, that's another one. There's not really a silver bullet um, because every group of individuals is a little bit different. Um, but I am. Um, yeah, I, I love to hear that you guys have a tactic around tackling that. So another one that I'd love to hear about, um, and this one is a little bit, it can be tricky to wrap your arms around. Um, but how is how have you gone about measuring the success of your um, self-service analytic, analytics adoption efforts? Um, Katie, I'd love to hear from you on this one. Sure. I think there are some simple, very accessible ways to measure user traffic within tools. You can typically see how many users you have, how many views you have, and that may be a pretty straightforward way to measure success quantitatively. But I don't think that will always show you the quality of adoption. Um, so we'll also look at observing different qualitative factors, such as simply the propensity for our business partners to seek partnership with analytics and or ask for training. Uh, if they're proactively asking for training or asking for help, it shows me that they want to use information, which is really the critical piece to that change management long-term mindset shift. That makes total sense. Um, anything, anything, Yasser, Michael, from your side that you want to add to that? Sure, I can add to that. Um, as part of the onboarding process, we expect them to document their use case and their expectation. Uh, and then obviously after we implement, we go back and say, did it meet your expectations? And some of the expectations where possible would be expressed as, um, you know, quantitative uh, savings or savings in time. And, you know, quite frequently we see people saying what used to take us a week now takes us one, you know, half a day or an hour instead of a day or things like that. And those, you know, those things find their ways into the testimonials and those are quite, quite positive. I, um, I think it, that sort of method of documenting each use case and, and setting a goalpost and saying, this is where we think, this is where we think we're going to be. And hey, if we don't get there, that's okay. Let's inspect what happened. And if we do, that's great. And if we pass it even better, um, it really is a, a really effective way of sort of benchmarking where are we? Did we get where we set out to? So that, um, that's very interesting. I do have one little note as well to add on that. 
Um, so ThoughtSpot actually has a really robust interior, interior tracking tool within their live boards that we've been utilizing. Uh, when I did Beyond last year, we were still just setting things up, and now we've pretty much been live for a year. Um, it's really powerful, especially for Snowflake credit consumption, uh, because you can actually see how many queries folks are running. And if we see people generating a lot of credit consumption, uh, we can actually go talk to them and ask them, hey, do you really need to run that same thing 25 times, or is this something that we could learn, you know, and take away from there. Um, we've really appreciated that level of insight into what people are doing. Absolutely, that is, um, that's true. We, we do have built-in built -in live boards for that. One of the things that we've talked about a couple of times, I know Michael, you mentioned this, you also you as well around the, the change management and you know specifically around documenting use cases, sort of addressing that what's in it for me, why are we asking people to change? Um, what are the specific tactics that have worked well to communicate the value of ThoughtSpot to your business users? Um, yes, maybe, maybe we can start with you because you just mentioned that you do um, document the use cases in a formal way. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to the testimonials, right? If you can prove that you have savings, um, and, and by the way, the savings come not just from um, using ThoughtSpot as a tool itself. It also comes from getting rid of other tools, right? So if, if we can replace three or four tools, uh, with ThoughtSpot, then, you know, obviously we turn those off and we have significant savings. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, it's pretty much what I said before. Yeah. Katie, what about from your side, anything, anything that you want to add around really demonstrating the value of ThoughtSpot to your end users? Cause you were saying you've got also a mix of sort of personas or user types. I would agree with everything that you mentioned demos themselves, testimonials, the testimonials themselves are very powerful. As soon as someone sees what is possible, they, they believe it and start to see how they can configure a use case for their own purposes, uh, how much versatility there is. So, um, I would say, you know, anchoring to the demos is really powerful. What I'm hearing is that demos and testimonials are really the most powerful tool in terms of driving adoption. I see everyone nodding. Tony, Tony. Yeah, I would add one thing to that. When our user is listening to this and they're thinking about ThoughtSpot and they're rolling it out to their companies, uh, it's so important to crawl, walk, run in your demos. Um, you could really scare a user that's not as technically savvy with all the impressive things that ThoughtSpot can do. So just kind of ease them into it uh, is what my best advice to give you. That's actually that's actually a really good point, Michael, and something that I hear a lot of customers um, brainstorming how they want to do, which leads me to my next question, which is, um, we've already mentioned a couple of times the role that training and education play in driving confidence and driving their understanding. Um, so how does that concept of crawl, walk, run play into, Michael, like your guys' enablement strategy around ThoughtSpot? Yeah. Um, so one of the best ways, and um, I think it's been talked about a few times now, is is looking at those individual use cases. So we're part of the business um, pillar within the organization, even though we work super closely with IT and the product teams. Um, and just understanding what the users would actually use it for. Uh, like I used to teach um, Excel, for example, and people would come away with it being like, oh, that's so cool. V lookup, I love it. And then they forget about it because they're like, well, how can I actually apply this in my daily life? And so by really taking the time to kind of pre-set up the training so that you can guide it for what they actually need it for and maybe even have a few examples of real life use cases or real reports that they're using and how you can easy, easily mimic it and save it, they can refresh it automatically whenever they want. Um, I, I, I can't imagine anything more important next to accuracy. Absolutely, makes sense. Um, Katie, anything from your side that you want to add? I know that, you know, we were, we were talking earlier about training. Um, and I, I love the training and education topics. I think they're extremely important. Um, I personally am passionate about this topic because I'm a natural learner. If you've ever heard of the strength finders test, uh, learners in my top five. So it's very familiar to me. Um, but I think, you know, self-service adoption is very much rooted in, trust, which we've mentioned trust in the data, but it's also trust, trust and confidence for the user um, to be able to leverage the tool and know that they are using that properly. And that often requires a little bit of training. 
Um, and so if training is not easily accessible, if we're not promoting the adoption, if we're not promoting the training, if it's not a priority, adoption will obviously be slow. So I think an important part of an effective training program includes, you know, they can't be siloed. Um, like we've mentioned already, they need to be tailored to fit the right level of maturity, the right audience and right level of maturity of the user. Um, and they should also use different channels. So some people may need a more uh, self-service, off-the-shelf recorded capability. Others may do better live, uh, hands-on. So you really have to meet the, the user where they are um, and help them see the value. I love that. I, that that definitely um, all resonates. And I, I want to I wanna bring us home with one last quick question, um, which is obviously with the recent announcements uh, around our, you know, around Sage and AI, AI powered analytics, um, I'd love to hear from you, Yas. Um, I'll, I'll direct this one over to you. What do you think the potential of AI powered analytics, specifically GPT, um, is to be used for increasing that self-service analytics in your organization? Yeah, I think the potential is huge, and it actually ties in to, to the uh, question about training. My my opinion is that, especially for the end users, you want to scare them as little as possible with tr needed training, right? If they want to come and look for it, it should be readily available, but effectively, you should tell them, here, you know, just go use it, and you'll get better and better. You know, if you have a specific answer, you go look it up, like, you know, like we do YouTube for everything else, right? Um, but with the introduction of GPT, it gets even easier. I mean, you can now talk in, in uh, natural language and ask questions and it interprets and translates it to the, the thought spot keywords. Um, and then especially if you can get the results described, um, it makes it very, very intuitive for users to explain what they're seeing in the graphs, right? So I, I, I think that this will become more and more a self-service tool uh, that is a completely natural experience. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Yas. And a big thank you to all of our presenters today, Michael, Katie, and Yas. That's a wrap on this session. If you'd like to dive further into how to increase analytics adoption, please scan the QR code on your left here for the Harvard Business Review on Self-Service Analytics Empowerment. We also have a free 30-day trial of ThoughtSpot. We encourage you to try. Thank you for joining us.